my name is Stephen White and I'm speaking to you from Carlisle Library. Carlisle Library were hosting the series of local studies talks. First of all, happy Christmas to you all. Uh, and I'd just like to tell you that the library is open once again for business, so come along down. Right, today's local history talk is on tea. And I can see when you say local history, some people go poop poop. Lift your head up. Local history, it's just like looking at your bootlaces. Where's the national perspective on things? Well, today I think we're going to have a, a world perspective on tea. And this is a talk about how tea came to Cumbria and how Cumbrians helped take tea to the world. So this is a talk that includes smuggling, food adulteration, New World Revolution, opium wars. I did think it, uh, about putting uh, drug cartels instead of opium wars, but we've gone with opium wars. Um, you might just think still, what, you know, tea, it's just a, uh, a drink, it's water. What possible story can there be there? Well, I call as my first witness George Orwell. George Orwell in 1946 wrote an article entitled A Nice Cup of Tea. In it, in it, he called tea. He made this massive claim that it was one of the mainstays of civilization in this country. We'll come back to George Orwell. Witness number two. That great man of letters, Samuel Johnson, a lexicographer and moral writer. He called tea a fascinating plant. Tea amuses the evening. Tea solaces the midnight. Tea welcomes the morning. He was apparently capable at one sitting of drinking 25 cups of tea. Amazing. So in practical terms, what does that mean, tea civilises? Uh, and tea solaces. Well, I've just got to attempt to show uh, one or two uh, physical examples of this, so just bear with me. Here you are, this is uh, Ambleside, this is the uh, studio of the photographer Moses Bowness. Probably in the late 1870s, two ladies have decided to have their photograph taken. They've come along in their best gear. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Had their hair done. They want to put their best front forward. But they wanted to add that element, don't they? They want to add an element of refinement, of civilization. And how have they chosen to portray that? Well, just look, they're pouring tea and drinking tea. Rossley, just outside Carlisle, it's near Wigton, about uh, 1906, 1907. Uh, Rossley House, the little boy is called Billy. And here you can see the very process of civilization. Perhaps this is Billy's very first cup of tea. One of perhaps 10,000. He's got his own little cup there, his own little saucer he's been taught, how to hold it, how to expect, what, how to behave. And behind you can see all the tea paraphernalia. You can just feel that uh, Billy, perhaps somewhat reluctantly, has been introduced to a world uh, that is going to civilise him. And tea solaces. Margaret Foster, the Carlisle author, uh, wrote a book called Hidden Lives, which is essentially about herself, her mother Lillian, and her grandmother uh, Margaret Anne. In 1934, uh, Margaret Anne was a widow and she was living with Lillian at 44 Orton Road. One day a car turns up at the house. Neighbours' heads are turned because cars in Carlisle in 1934, not that common. A stranger gets out. She comes to the house, knocks on the door. Lillian answers. The stranger asks if Mary, uh, Margaret, Anne Hind lives there. Uh, yes, she replies, that's my mother. Uh, she shows the stranger into the front parlour, as you would. Her mother comes down, a look of shock appears on her face when she sees the stranger, and she takes the stranger up into her bedroom. There they have a long conversation. The stranger comes down, gets back into a car and goes. Uh, Lillian is a bit of in awe of her mother, waits downstairs, waits for her mother to come down. Her mother doesn't come down. Eventually, she takes her courage in her hands. She goes upstairs, taps gently on the door, and then pokes her head round. A mother, who's quite a stoic figure, barely shows emotion, is lying on the bed. She's obviously been weeping. Is there anything wrong, mother, she asks. There's no reply. And then the only thing she can think to say in this moment of crisis is, would you like a cup of tea, mother? She leaves her mother, her mother says she'll, she'll be down shortly. Uh, her mother doesn't appear for another eight hours. The mystery behind all this, it's rather a, a sad story. Uh, Margaret Anne Hind was illegitimate 
and she herself had an illegitimate child, uh, an illegitimate child that none of her legitimate children knew anything about. This was a complete secret. Tea was first introduced uh, into this country in the 1660s. This is very late. The Chinese have been drinking tea for 2,000 years before this. It was supposed to have been popularised by Catherine uh, of Braganza, the wife of Charles II. Uh, she brought the tea drinking habit into the court and it spread from there. If it was popular in the court, then other people imitated her. Here's uh, Pepys in his diary saying he had a cup of tea, which I've never drunk before. This is 1660. The first local reference I can find to tea is from Bishop Nicholson. He's the Bishop of Carlisle. Uh, and in 1709, he's in London at the time, not in, not in Cumberland, uh, he said he, he drank some tea with the deans of St. Asaph. As with anything, there was a reaction against the introduction of this uh, new fangled substance. Uh, and Jonas Hanway wrote in 17, 1757, to what a height of folly must a nation be arrived when common people are not satisfied with wholesome food at home? but must go to the remotest regions to please a vicious palate. He, who should be able to drive three Frenchmen before him, or she, who might be a breeder of such a race, are now to be seen sipping tea. Were they the sons of sea tippers who won the fields of Cressy and Agincourt, or dyed the Danube streams with Gallic blood? Colourful stuff. But even towards the end of the century, uh, still there's prejudice against tea and in this particular case it's a Cumberland correspondent. This is a, um, an article that appeared in the Cumberland packet 1792. The correspondent says that during the latest uh, harvest at Greystoke the female reapers regularly had their tea. How different from the beefsteaks beef of old. How degenerate is the present age. How debilitating may the next be. But it couldn't stop the rise of tea. Here we've got the Reverend George Williamson of Arthur noting in his diary uh, half a pound of green tea. All tea, or most tea at this period, right up to 1800, was unfermented green tea. Black tea became more popular, but we'll come to that. By the end of the century, tea was even being drunk by the urban poor. Here you can see in Eden's State of the Poor, 1797, he refers to the poor of Colgate. Tea is substituted for hasty pudding. He notices a lady who's living in the countryside in Cumbutton was rather proud of the fact that she'd never had a teapot in her house at any period of her life. And this gives you some idea about the tea imported from China. Uh, all imported by the East Indian Company, which had a monopoly on the trade. As you can see, by 1750, something like four and three quarter million tons of tea were being brought by ship to this country. Tea was expensive. How expensive? Well, we could give you the price. Uh, in about 1760, uh, a hawk's head grocer, uh, Anne Tyson, was selling tea uh, for one and six per quarter. But how much was one and six in those days? What we can say is her husband, who was a skilled carpenter, uh, was earning 10 pence a day. In other words, it would have taken him a day and a half to earn enough money to buy a quarter pound of tea. Of course, it had to be transported from China, but also there was a tremendous tax on tea throughout the 19th, throughout the 18th rather, century. Tea was a luxury. Uh, tea uh, was an expensive commodity. Tea had to be locked up. And here you can see a tea caddy, one of the tea caddies in the collection of Tully House, uh, really a fine looking object. And there you can see the lock and the key and the little boxes that contained uh, the precious leaves. Tea and tax go together. The average tax in this country uh, in the 18th century was 119%. It was a massive tax. Tax, of course, uh, was at the root, or one of the roots, of the American War of Independence. And here you can see a petition to King George from Monkhouse Davidson and Abraham Newman. At the Boston Tea Party, or one of the Boston Tea Parties, um, a number of their chests had been thrown into Boston Harbour by men dressed as Indians. This is a very famous episode, but what perhaps uh, you won't know, and I didn't realise till quite recently, is that actually Monkhouse Davidson was a Carlisle man. Here you can see him. His father was Isaac Davison, who was 
uh, from Carlisle and his mother was Jane Monkhouse of Dalston. Monkhouse himself was uh, born in uh, 1713. His sister Mary, born in 1720, also in Carlisle, she went on to marry Abraham Newman, who was the other half in the uh, partnership. Monkhouse Davison went to London and became a grocer, but that's not a grocer in any sense that we know a grocer, a corner shop man. This is a grocer, a merchant. Upon his death in 1783, he left in 1783 terms uh, a will, an estate to the value of £600,000. That's billionaire style. His father and, other, and mother were buried uh, in the cathedral churchyard. There was a stone to them. These stones have now been cleared, of course, uh, but that's the memorial inscription to the family. He himself uh, died in London, um, and although he never came back to live in Carlisle, he had a state appear, took an interest in the area, um, and when he died, he owned, amongst other properties, the Dalston Hall estate. His own company of Davidson and Newman went on, of course, to make great play of their uh, connection with the American War of Independence and the Boston Tea Party. And here you can see their Boston Harbour Tea. So, as just to emphasise, the tax on tea was 119% until 1784, uh, when Pitt decided to pass the Computation Act and reduce the tax to 12.5%. Before that tax on tea meant that smuggling uh, into this country uh, was a big issue for the revenue and excise men. Here you can see that in 1770 the annual consumption of legal tea was between 4 to 5 million pounds, but it was estimated that smuggled tea was between 4 to 7.5 million pounds. Uh, here's an example. Uh, the Reverend James Woodford quite openly in 1777 notes in his diaries, Andrews the smuggler brought me this night about 11 o'clock a bag of heist and tea. He frightened us a little by whistling under the parlour window. Uh, of course the population didn't really think smuggling was a crime, they wanted to get cheap tea. We've got evidence of this smuggling here in our own uh, churchyards and parish registers. One of the key things was there were different rates of tax on tea. In the Isle of Man, tea could be brought in quite legally at a much, rate, a much smaller uh, rate of tax than in England. It was only natural then that people were determined to smuggle tea uh, across the Solway. And here you can see, bonus on Solway parish registers, Thomas Stowell, a smuggler, buried. December the 20th, 1755. And he actually has a gravestone most unusually, and here you can see, this is his gravestone in Bowness and Solway uh, churchyard. I've actually dusted it with flour to try and pick out the letters. Um, he was from um, Ramsey on the Isle of Man. He was aged 22, and the story is that they were pursued by the king's boat from uh, Skin Burness. Uh, shots were exchanged, and a stray shot uh, hit him and killed him, and he's uh, buried in the Bonus on Solway Churchyard. Just beside him, but in an unmarked grave, are uh, seven other smugglers who were drowned in 1762. A dangerous business, but one that was very acceptable to the uh, population of Carlisle. And the papers are full of stories of um, smugglers uh, being caught. Here you are the packet, the local paper reports in 1775 that smugglers had landed uh, near Rockcliffe. Uh, the first one was intercepted on foot and gave up two pounds of tea to the excisemen. Uh, the second one gave up more tea and a considerable number of Barcelona handkerchiefs. The final one put up a, a struggle. He'd got a, a horse and cart uh, and the seizure of rum and tea was estimated to be 50 pounds. Very profitable business. Right, another graveyard, another graveyard in Cumbria. This is the graveyard of Crosby Ravensworth. On the left there, you can see the gravestone of Lancelot Dent of Canton uh, and Skirsgill. On the right in the church there is a memorial to John Dent of uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai. All the tea uh, that was imported into this country came from China. The East Indian Company had a monopoly on tea. 
tea had to be bought, of course, for silver. And one of the problems was that the Chinese weren't really interested in trading. Uh, they restricted the traders to uh, particular areas and particular ports. They were quite happy with everything they had. They bought the occasional cotton. Uh, they thought pretty much that their civilization was much better than uh, the Western Europeans. Everything they made was better. They didn't really want anything. And that was a problem because the silver was going in one direction. That was into the Chinese coffers. What could we possibly offer them? Well, there was one thing that there was a demand for in China, and that was Indian-grown opium. And as you can see, these are estimates of the import um, of Indian opium into China. As you can see, by 1830, it's estimated 18,000 chests of opium were being imported illegally, smuggled uh, into China. This had two effects. It meant actually now that the balance of payments was in uh, the British and the East Indian, East Indian Company's favour. Uh, the Chinese were paying so much uh, for opium. The other concern, of course, was the, the ruinous state this was having on hundreds of thousands of Chinese lives uh, with a, an opium uh, addiction. The East Indian Company, uh, which ran China, uh, was responsible for the cultivation of most of the opium. They didn't actually allow it to be smuggled into the countries upon their own ships, but they were quite happy to turn a blind eye and sell it to uh, anybody they liked. Uh, the Chinese in 1838-1839 decided to put a, a stop to the trade. Uh, the government was weak, however. Um, the government was very corrupt. Local officials were corrupt. Local officials were making lots of money out of the smuggling uh, and working uh, with the uh, British uh, and American merchants. However, it was decided uh, to send this man, I'll pronounce him as Lin Tse Hu, uh, quite a hero uh, in uh, China today, very much so. He decided to send him and he was to put an end uh, to the smuggling. He turned up at Canton uh, in 1839 uh, uh, he demanded that the merchants there, remember they were restricted to certain ports, he demanded that they turn over uh, all their opium. Um, and then uh, he laid siege. There was no violence, he just simply uh, laid siege to the place, to Canton, for 47 days. Uh, initially, uh, the merchants gave him a, a thousand chests, but um, eventually they were to turn over 20,000 chests of opium to this man. Here you can see the destruction uh, of those chests of opium. He also uh, wanted to speak to, arrest, uh, and it was feared, perhaps execute, specifically Lancelot Dent, who he considered to be uh, the chief opium dealer. This is our own Lancelot Dent, who's buried in uh, Crosby Ravensworth Churchyard. There was another individual there, and that individual was a, re was a representative uh, of the British government, a man called Elliot. And he persuaded the merchants to hand over their 20,000 chests. Uh, and he said, rashly, that this would, be, uh, this would be recompensed by the British government. He had no authority to say that. But they were then obviously happy to hand over the, the chests because they thought the British government was going to pay them. Back at home, the Prime Minister was Palmerston, uh, very keen on gunboat diplomacy, and he thought the Chinese should be uh, taught a lesson. The 20,000 chests that were thrown into uh, the, the seas, this was to the value of $9 million. It was only a matter of time before the British government got involved. Uh, this was outrageous. The Chinese needed to be taught a lesson. It was discussed in Parliament a vote was taken whether uh, a force, gunboat diplomacy, should be put into action. It was only passed by five votes. It was quite a, a close vote. And I'd have to say that the principal person who spoke against the war was Gladstone. And he said, a war more unjust in its origins, a war more calculated to cover this country with permanent disgrace. That's what Gladstone said. And the Chinese regard this as the beginning of a century of shame. This is very much 
um, a factor, a significant factor in, in Chinese history. Because gunboat diplomacy did take place, an expeditionary force did go to China. The Chinese army was old and antiquated. It was, couldn't possibly stand up to a modern army, a modern navy with modern weapons. Uh, an interesting uh, local connection in this first Opium War uh, was that one of the regiments that uh, took the town of Chi Sung was the 55th Regiment of Foot. The 55th Regiment of Foot uh, amalgamated with the 34th Regiment of Foot to become the Border Regiment. There's a plaque in the church at Kendall, in Kendall Parish Church, you can see this on the right, saying that the dragon's flag of the uh, Imperial Army was captured by the 55th Regiment of Foot and was hung up in the church in Kendall. There you are. Well, tea meant you could make money and another way of making money out of tea was adulterating it, bulking it out. Um, this could be done in various ways. You could make green tea, or rather you could make something which wasn't green tea, green tea by adding ferrous sulphate. You could bulk it out with uh, apparently with hawthorn leaves, uh, but also sheep's dung, uh, reused tea leaves, anything was thrown in there to make an extra profit. This naturally turned people against uh, green tea and there was a movement towards black tea and this is a uh, an advertisement for a Carlisle grocer uh, James Fleming and you can see in very small letters at the bottom there he emphasizes the fact that he is only supplying genuine tea but here you can see much more in your face the Carlisle genuine tea company and he says um, having appointed the following agents in the district um, the public will be supplied with unadulterated tea. It was very much in everybody's minds and this man was making a feature of that, that he was actually supplying the genuine thing. He wasn't supplying with ferrous sulphate, sheep stone or hawthorn leaves. So the East Indian Company had a monopoly uh, on tea imports uh, from China up until 1834. Uh, after they lost this monopoly, they turned their attention to the cultivation of tea in India, which they ran, uh, particularly Assam. Tea might always have been indigenous to the country, that's debatable, but certainly they developed the plantations there. Uh, and the first profits from the tea in uh, Assam were made in 1855. The majority of tea at this time, however, was still brought from China. And this is where we come into the realms, the romantic realms of these famous uh, clipper races, bringing the, the first flush, the highly prized first tea picked in the first flush, which was supposed to be uh, the best tasting tea. I think we're all familiar with the Cutty Shark, which was launched in 1869. And apparently on the ship that we see here, you could pack a million tons of tea. Amazing. Uh, once the Suez Canal was opened, however, in 1869, uh, some of the wind was taken out of these sails. But an interesting uh, race was 1865, um, and the ship which won the race uh, from China to London was the Fiery Cross. And the captain of that ship was Captain Richardson from Workington, uh, a local lad. When I say race, it wasn't really a race that had rules. There were no rules to the race. It was just the first one back. So in 1865, uh, this ship and the Sarika both entered the English Channel neck and neck. The Sarika then gained an advantage and led by two miles when it came to Beachy Head. However, uh, Richardson had some connections who sent out a steam tug to bring her into harbour and she raced ahead and won the prize. Tea obviously was everywhere. Here you can see an advert for a, a Carlisle uh, tea company, William Baines, the golden teapot for golden tea, 67 Scott Street. The marketplace and in the back there you can see on Glover's Row uh, a big advert for tea. The London and Newcastle Tea Company. And there's an interior showing the staff. No self-service here. 
tea spread with the empire. Uh, and the next place we find plantations would be Ceylon, still of course one of the biggest uh, producers of tea today. And here you can see John Strong advertising the fact uh, that you could buy the new industry Ceylon tea. And this is his warehouse. I don't know if you recognise that, I think it's, uh, it's a bit of a guess, but that's actually, the Ceylon tea warehouse is actually Marks and Spencer's site today. This is just before its demolition and Marks and Spencer's built uh, on this site, the building you can see today. Well, uh, tea was developed in, um, in Ceylon by uh, the uh, British planters and they imported 300,000 Tamils from South India into the country as coolies to work the plantations. They settled there uh, and a legacy of this unfortunately uh, was the ethnic divide uh, that affected the country uh, and resulted in the uh, devastating civil war. Into the war of course uh, the Germans were sinking our ships uh, just quite a nice, interesting, a lighter touch. Private H.E. Mansell of Whitehaven has to write home to report that he's been wounded in both his hand and shoulder. And also, he wants to mention, um, he's had to resort to smoking tea leaves in the trenches. We must smoke while plugging away at the Germans. And World War II, it's just the same, of course. The Germans were sinking our boats, which were bringing tea in. And this is a fantastic photograph, isn't it? Uh, this is to celebrate the end of the war. Uh, and these floats went round Carlisle. And this particular one uh, is under the banner Housewives Undaunted, 1945. And you can tell this is Carlisle because look behind these undaunted housewives. And I think they look pretty daunting to me. You can see that's the turf in in the background. Quite hilly, can't you? Uh, during the war, uh, people over five were rationed to two ounces of tea and it's reckoned that this would just make a one or two cups of weak tea. There's nothing worse than weak tea, uh, is there? Housewives and Daunted, 1945, but tea didn't come off the ration for another seven years until 1952. Mm, hard times still to come. Uh, tea is still uh, blended in Carlisle. There's John Watts on uh, uh, Bank Street. This is one of their adverts, uh, 19th century adverts. Uh, tea could cure everything, it solaced the night. In this particular case, it uh, cures seasickness if you read it. So let me go back to uh, George Orwell. George Orwell in his 1946 uh, article on tea laid down how you should make a cup of tea. There are 11 points. Uh, he said, use Indian or uh, Ceylon tea Chinese tea is its virtues, but it does not have much stimulation in it, nor does one feel wiser, braver, or more optimistic after drinking it. I don't know if you agree. Two should be made in small quantities. Tea out of an urn is always tasteless. I think we'd agree to that, absolutely. Uh, tea should be made um, in a pot, china or earthenware, metal pots of any sort produce an inferior brew. Uh, and on the right there you can see a marriage gift. It's a teapot. Uh, it's for a Whitehaven couple. 1770, quite a nice touch. Three, the pot uh, should be warm beforehand. Four, the tea should be strong. One strong cup of tea is better than 20 weak ones. All true tea lovers like their tea strong and probably a little stronger as they get older. Uh, fifthly, the tea should be put straight in the pot. No strainers on muslin bags or other devices to imprison the tea. I like that, it's a beautiful expression, isn't it? Imprisoning the tea. Put the tea in there, don't strain it out. We all drink tea from tea bags. They were invented in 1908. Well, George Orwell didn't approve, so stop it. Uh, six, once you take the teapot to the kettle and not the other way around. Uh, the water should actually be boiling at the moment of impact. Some people add that one should only use water that's been freshly boiled, but he hasn't noticed that's made any difference. Seventh, after making tea, uh, one should stir it, or better still, shake the pot to allow the tea to settle. Did you realise tea was such a complicated matter? Eight, one should drink out of a breakfast cup. That is a cylindrical type of cup, not the flat, shallow type. The breakfast cup holds more, uh, the other kind 
it's always half cold before winter started it. This is a photograph uh, taken um, of the Border Regiment in training up at Carlisle Racecourse uh, and it shows their mess facilities and what I particular about these is they look like enamel cups to me so they wouldn't be approved of. I'm also very impressed with the thickness of the bread there. Oh, real gobstoppers. Back to Orwell. Um, one should pour the cream off the milk before using it in the tea. I think that's true isn't it? I don't want those sort of sticky mess floating upon the top. Tenth, you should always pour the tea into the cup first. This is one of the most controversial points of all and I know that's very true. I had this discussion with somebody last week about putting the milk or the tea in first so this is a serious matter but he thinks the tea should go in first. Lastly, tea should be drunk without sugar. He's in the minority there he says uh, but he thinks that gives the the true strength of tea. Now uh, I can send you these 10 points and I think they're important you probably want to take them on board so if you would like contact us and we'll uh, email you a copy of Orwell's uh, 11 points in making a, a good cup of tea. It's never too late to learn. Also if you'd like I'd very much like to send you a copy of Samuel Johnson's essay Defending Tea. Everybody once in their life should read something by Johnson. Uh, and I can also send you, if you'd like, a recipe that appeared in the newspapers, local newspapers in the First World War, for a tea substitute that was made up of various herbs in bits and pieces that you can pick up in the fields as you go out. So, happy Christmas and goodbye. My name's Stephen White, I used to work at Cumbria Libraries, and this is one of a series of talks on local history subject. It's just my take on the talks, talks that you'll be able to find on Facebook and YouTube. Some might be right, some might be wrong. If you've got any comments, get in contact, got any suggestions, I'd love to hear from you.